When John Lee teaches concentration in his book, Frames of Reference, he doesn't start out with a breath. He starts out with other topics that are designed to give rise to a sense of sangwega and heedfulness. You think about your body and all the concerns of your life that revolve around the body. But what have you got here? It's nothing but physical elements. If you take the parts apart piece by piece, there's no particular part that you'd actually be attracted to on its own. In fact, when you think of them in the body right now, all drenched with blood, there's nothing attractive about them at all. And yet we can get so worked up about them. This reflection is meant to help you step back. Get some perspective on things. Then there's the contemplation of the three perceptions. Again, it's asking you to have a value judgment. Are these things worth it? This body you've got here, and all the concerns around the body. In this contemplation of death, someday you're going to leave this body. All the work you put into it to keep it healthy, to keep it strong, keep it functioning. And then someday it's just going to stop. And then where are you going to be? The whole purpose of this contemplation is to get you to see the importance of settling the mind down here in the present moment with the breath, so you can watch it and train it. That sense of heedfulness should inform everything you do as you practice. As the Buddha said, it's the beginning of all skillful qualities. Just as the footprint of an elephant can contain all the other footprints of the animals that walk on the land, heedfulness contains all the skillful qualities within it. Even the qualities that we think about as being more cheerful, like goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy. Our reason for developing those qualities of mind is because we see their importance in motivating us to do what is right, looking for happiness in a way that is harmless and genuine. That's how we have goodwill for ourselves and how we show goodwill to others. So as you're sitting or meditating, sometimes it's good to begin the session with thoughts like that. How could you have a sense of inspiration that this is really important work you're doing here? It does deserve your full attention. Otherwise, you just go through the motions. Stay with the breath for a little bit and then take a breather. Wander about thinking about this, thinking about that, and then coming back to the breath a little bit more. And there's nobody here to police your thoughts. But you have to remind yourself, if you don't get some control over your mind, what are you going to do when aging comes and the body doesn't function the way it used to, and you begin to see its ornery nature? You've learned to depend on it, and then suddenly it decides to become undependable. It stops doing certain things for a while, then it comes back and does them again. And you wonder, each time a particular ability goes, is this the last time? Is it finally going to stop for good? And you realize you can't really depend on the body at all. As for friends. They can be helpful. As the Buddha said, your best friends are your admirable friends, the ones who keep pointing you back to the practice. So wherever your mind might wander, remember there's an antidote to it. And the big antidote is just this quality of heedfulness. 
there's work that needs to be done. You've got to get the mind in shape. You've got to get the mind under control. Because when you're playing with death, death plays for keeps. Like that Bergman movie where the main character is playing chess with death. And you know death's got to win. And take not only all the pieces, but take the, the loser as well. And so what do you have that death can't take away? Well, you've got the qualities of your mind. You want to make sure they're strong. When the Buddha talks about the five strengths, he makes the point that each of them is nourished by heedfulness. Conviction, conviction in the Buddha's awakening, is nourished by heedfulness because you realize that the main message of the Buddha's awakening is that it is possible to find ultimate happiness through your own efforts. It's also possible to quench yourself a lot of suffering through your efforts. It's not that your efforts are just cast off into the universe with no consequences at all. It would be like throwing a stone into the water with there being no waves. There are waves, and they can bounce around like the waves in a lake and create some really strange patterns if you're not careful. And so when you realize the importance of your actions, then the heedful thing to do is to do your best to develop skillful qualities and to abandon unskillful ones. So you have to keep that in mind. That's how heedfulness keeps its message going, because we're so quick to forget these things. And we want to forget them. In Thailand, they allow monks to go into autopsy theaters to see what happens as they take bodies apart to figure out how and why they died. And one of the monks who went one time to one of these events told me that he stopped off first in the office of the, the doctors who were doing the autopsies. And there was a girly calendar on the wall. You'd think looking at bodies, dead bodies, day in and day out, there would be no way you could look at a human being and be attracted at all. But it just shows how determined we are, or determined we can be, to find some beauty here. But for what purpose? Certainly not a heedful one. So when the mind is so quick to forget and so determined to forget, we need to make our mindfulness strong. That's why we come to concentration practice. Keep returning to one theme, in this case the breath. You know, the mind wanted itself, you just bring it right back. There are times when you can relax into the breath, and it comes very easily. But it doesn't happen all the time. There will be times when the mind struggles, when it rebels, when it resists. And you've got to have good reasons to talk to it with. And here it is. When you die, you're really going to want to keep your mind under control and not lose it. And you want to have a good mood in the mind, a confident mood in the mind. And you can imagine how difficult that can be at times. You see people as they go through the process of dying in a hospital say, this organ doesn't function, that one doesn't function. You get given drugs that obscure your mind. The people around you get upset. And in the midst of all that, you've got to keep your wits together. And you've got to figure out what you can do as the breath leaves. You still have those other fabric fabrications, your directed thought and evaluation, the perceptions you hold in mind, and feelings. You have the feeling of pain in the body. You don't want to Make sure there's 
a part of the mind that's not affected by that pain. That's just aware of it, but doesn't get overwhelmed by it. In other words, you're going to need your discernment. Again, you nourish this discernment with heedfulness. There's so many ways that you can exercise your discernment in this world. But by developing the skills you'll need, so you realize as death comes and you have to let go of things, things are being torn from your grasp, well, you let go voluntarily and you're not shaken by having to let go, because you know there's something that doesn't die. Ideally, you want to be able to have seen the deathless before this comes. Although even then, the Buddha points out that even stream enters can be a little bit heedless. Fortunately, they're not so heedless that they would do anything unskillful in their actions and their words. But they can still have some unskillful thoughts. So even then you have to ride herd on your mind. Remember that. Buddha's last words to the monks were to achieve consummation with heedfulness or through heedfulness. And everybody in that crowd of monks was at least a stream enter. So the stream enters needed some encouragement even then. So when even stream enters need encouragement to be heedful, what about you? They're certain, in other words, they're certain they're not going to fall to a lower realm. But until you've reached that level, you're not certain. And the only way we're going to make ourselves certain is to develop these strengths. Conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, discernment. When you think in these ways, then it gives more focus to the mind and more energy to the desire to want to stay focused, to want to stay on top of what you're doing right here, right now learning how to observe your own mind and exert some control over it. There will be things coming into the mind that come from past karma over which you have no control. But you want to be able to face them, deal with them. And if you can't do that now, how are you going to do it when, when the mind gets weaker, the body gets weaker? So the message of heedfulness is, there's work to be done, and now is the time to do it. And this is the good work to be doing, getting your mind focused. Becoming skilled with the breath so that you would like to stay focused here. That's, that's another aspect of heedfulness. It's not always telling you, you know, you've got work to do, work to do, work to do. It's telling you, you've got to learn how to strengthen yourself. Make yourself eager to do the work. So there's the pleasure of pleasant breath sensations permeating the body. There's the pleasure of having a sense that you get more and more control over the mind. You can see that you're mastering a skill. And it's an important skill. Because heedfulness doesn't just remind you of dangers. It reminds you that there are ways to protect yourself from those dangers, because that's the message. Your actions do make a difference. They can make a huge difference. So what's the difference you want to make? If you want to make a, a good difference, you stay focused right here. So when death comes to play for keeps, You've got something that the death can't take from you.